Hi, I'm firearms attorney Gilbert Ambler, and today I want to talk about the recent Supreme Court arguments in the Cargill case. This is the bump stock case. Arguments were held this week. There's been many YouTubers commenting on what those arguments entailed, but I want to focus on a particular subject, because when I listen to these arguments, I listen to them with a goal in mind. The goal was to try to predict how the ATF in the future might be treating binary triggers. because Bump stocks, and I hate to be a, a defeatist on this, but the path is already set on bump stocks. The ATF has done what they've done. Now it's a waiting game. I can't change that game at this point. The Supreme Court's heard the case. It's going to be up to the Supreme Court on what they do. So we can't change that, But and maybe they will protect bump stocks. But we could affect, through preparing for litigation, prepare on how to defend binary triggers. Now, before we dive into this subject, if you have not yet hit that subscribe button, go ahead, hit subscribe for us, like, comment with your thoughts, and share with your friends. That way you and your friends can keep getting this important Second Amendment-related content. Before we do a deep dive on this subject, most of you know what a bump stock is and how it functions, as well as know what a binary trigger is, but we're going to do a quick overview for those of you who might not be familiar with the actual mechanics. And the reason I think this is so important, especially after listening to the argument, is I realized during the course of the argument just how many of the justices who are going to be deciding this case don't mechanically understand how a bump stock functions. A bump stock is simply a, a chassis that a semi-automatic weapon sits in. The semi-automatic weapon, when it's fired, recoils backwards. Your finger rests on a peg of this chassis, and as the weapon recoils backwards, the shooter pushes the forward the weapon forward again. The trigger resets when the rifle fires. Uh, the forward momentum forcing it backwards, which resets the trigger. The shooter's forward push on the rifle then fires it again. The trigger finger doesn't actually move. Essentially, you are bouncing the trigger back and forth off the finger, using the recoil of the rifle to reset the firing mechanism, to reset the trigger. Now, many of the justices seem to misunderstand this, and seem to misunderstand, generally speaking, the statute that is at question here. Because some of the justices, particularly Justice Jackson, seem to believe that any weapon that fired like a machine gun, they were really focused on rate of fire. You know, if, if it fired similar to 800 to 900 rounds per minute, that would make it a machine gun, right? And counsel for Cargill had to keep reminding them, that's not what the statute says. I also found it very concerning when one of the more conservative justices, I believe it was Alito, questioned counsel for Cargill on how if he were to rewrite the statute to try to target bump stocks, if it were up to him and he had to rewrite the statute as Congress to outlaw bump stocks, how he would rewrite it. And he paused for a minute and then said, well, I think I would probably write it in such a way that it covered anything that sped up the firing of a semi-automatic weapon. And he admitted that that was probably overly broad, but that was a hugely concerning statement from him, because that will rope in just about every competition trigger out there, any lightened trigger, anything that would speed up your firing of a semi-automatic. Obviously, we hope the ATF didn't pay too much attention to that, because we don't want Congress, or not really the ATF, we don't want Congress to adopt that definition in the future. ATF, as you guys know, they don't have the power to make up laws, although they sometimes appear to think that they can. Um, let's talk about binary triggers for just a second, because a binary trigger, unlike a bump stock, works when the trigger is pulled, it discharges one round, and then when the trigger is released, it discharges a second round. So it, too, speeds up the rate of fire of a semi-automatic firearm. And what I think happened is I think the government, in going after bump stocks, actually made statements that are really helpful to protect binary triggers. Because the government's theory on bump stocks is that the court should focus not so much on the trigger itself, because the trigger, of course, is resetting and getting pulled again every time a bump stock equipped firearm discharges, unlike a traditional machine gun, where the trigger is simply held down and the weapon keeps discharging. So the government, in order to have creative lawyering to get around this statutory problem, wants the court to focus not on the mechanics of the trigger, but on the function of the shooter. 
what is the shooter doing? The government's theory on this point was that because it is one motion by the shooter that discharges multiple rounds, shooter pushes forwards on the weapon, weapon bumps back and forth, multiple rounds are discharged, that because it's only a singular motion by the shooter, that the court should determine that makes the bump stock a machine gun because there's multiple rounds firing for one, quote, function, according to the government, the function of the shooter, not the function of the trigger itself. Now, the reason this statement is so important to us is because the government would have to concede that with a binary trigger, the shooter has to take two motions. They have to pull and then release, pull and then release. And because there are two motions there, according to the government's own argument, that binary trigger could not possibly be deemed a machine gun. So I think that's a very helpful point and something to look for in the future. Now look, lawyers are very creative. That's one of the things we learned from the Cargill case. The fact that they're even getting this to the Supreme Court, that they've gotten so many courts to say that a bump stocked equipped weapon is a machine gun. Lawyers are creative. I mean, they're refocusing. They're trying to argue that the trigger is not the curved piece of metal that we all think of the trigger. Because frankly, if the trigger is the curved piece of metal that we all know intuitively is a trigger, then this is a very easy case because the trigger is getting just pulled multiple times just very, very rapidly by the recoil of the weapon. The government had to argue here that the trigger also included the the rest of the foregrip of the weapon that was being pushed forwards. And the government's argument is that that foregrip is somehow part of the trigger. I thought it was a ridiculous argument, but if courts are buying it, I guess it's not so ridiculous because if they can get the Supreme Court to rule that way, then that, for the purposes of the law, becomes part of the trigger. So lawyers are creative. That's not to say that the ATF won't come up with some way to come after bump stock or come after binary triggers in the future. But I thought that their argument actually was helpful and actually leads us a way to protect binary triggers down the road. Other thing that I thought was just kind of humorous from the argument was multiple times they mentioned, counsel for the government mentioned, that although someone could bump stock a semi-automatic weapon off of their belt loop, that it was only experts that could do that. So if you've ever been able to go outside and bump, bump a weapon off your belt loop, a semi-automatic weapon, which really isn't that hard to do, guess what? The government considers you a firearms expert. Congratulations. We should sign you up for expert testimony down the road. And the government's point on this was that the difference between bump firing off your belt loop, because under their theory that the forward pressure on the foregrip is part of the trigger, the way they were able to differentiate bump firing off the belt loop versus bump firing with a bump stock was that the chassis portion of the mechanical chassis portion that the rifle sits in becomes part of the trigger. Your belt loop, they said, is not a mechanical part of the rifle, so therefore not part of the trigger. So let's pay attention to this case. It will be fascinating to see how the decision is written because the decision is going to really give us a lot more guidance on whether we should be worried about binary triggers in the future or not. But for the time being, I think the government's arguments were helpful. If you enjoyed this content, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. Until next time.